Okay, welcome everyone. Um, just to allow a few minutes for everyone to settle in and to other, others to arrive, um, to allow a bit of time for that, um, we have a short video uh, to watch. And um, so we'll play that now. This is uh, Daga uh, Nagtaudan or Ancestral Land. Welcome everyone, I'm Andrew Morrison and I'll be facilitating tonight's forum. I'm a member of PASA, that's the Philippines Australia Solidarity Association and also a member of the Blockade IMARC Alliance. Uh, tonight's forum is jointly hosted by PASA 
Yes to Life, No to Mining and the Blockade IMARC Alliance. I'm on Wurundjeri land, so I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners. On behalf of other participants in other parts of this continent, I'd like to acknowledge that the land belongs to First Nations people in those places. I'd like to pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I'd like to acknowledge their sovereignty never ceded. I'd also like to pay special respects to First Nations people and Elders in the Philippines and those who are with us here today. Uh, I need to start by uh, mentioning a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, please be aware that tonight's forum is being recorded. Uh, it's also being live streamed on Facebook. Uh, we've muted all mics except for the speakers as a way of managing the discussion. We'll be taking questions via chat, so please feel free to use that. Uh, and we'll also be getting questions from the Facebook live stream. Uh, we, we might not be able to discuss all your questions. We might just not have time to do that, but we'll do our best. Um, also, uh, I'd like to mention a cyclone relief fundraising appeal. Um, and you can see the, the details there on your screen now. Uh, and um, we'll also put that in the chat. So there's a downloadable PDF. Um, that should be shared in the chat around now. Uh, and um, yeah, so recent cyclones, uh, as you've probably seen in the news, have devastated hundreds of communities in the Philippines and we're raising funds to provide support to affected communities. So please give generously. Tonight's forum focuses on anti-mining struggles in the Philippines with an emphasis on First Nations involvement in that struggle or those struggles. Um, we've got a wonderful panel of land and human rights defenders to talk about that and I'll introduce each of them as we go. After the talks we'll have a QA and a session and we'll open up the discussion to First Nations elders and leaders first and primarily as well as responding to questions from the chat and Facebook live stream. So it's now my privilege and pleasure to introduce our first speaker Enteng Bautista to speak about Philippine mining and COVID. Uh, Enteng is the national coordinator of the Calicarsan People's Network for the Environment, Calicarsan PNE. Uh, he's been in that role since 2003. Calicarsan is a network of people's organisations, non governmental organisations, and environmental activists, act advocates, I should say, and activists. Uh, it aims to address environmental issues in a way that gives primacy to the people, especially at the grassroots level, who constitute the overwhelming majority of the population. This ensures all environmental, uh, all environmental concerns will have the people's interests at their core. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Enteng. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, Solidarity greetings to all. Uh, congratulations to the event of this uh, uh, forum and uh, for the protest event that uh, you're doing uh, on the IMARC uh, conference. Uh, I hope uh, I could uh, contribute uh, to your efforts. Uh, again, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, activity. Uh, I prepared a uh, PowerPoint presentation to help me in my discussion. Uh, is it now sharing? Yeah, um, I, wa I was uh, tasked uh, to discuss the Philippine mining situation under the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, could be... Uh, Next slide, please, or could we play it? Yeah, okay, anyway. Uh, as of uh, last week, there were around 400,000 uh, Filipinos that have been uh, affected, uh, confirmed infected with coronavirus-19 with almost 80,000 deaths. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to relate uh, the big mining to the aggravation of health, social, environmental and economic crisis in the Philippines. 
Uh, next slide, please. As uh, we all know, many of epidemic and pandemic outbreaks were of zoonotic uh, origins, meaning the this uh, diseases, uh, the particularly the virus originated from the uh, natural environment, which have been significantly uh, disrupted by uh, human activities. Uh, next slide, please. Among which are the clearing of our forests, the worsening climate change, and the dissemination of our uh, biodiversity. Next slide. Uh, the ongoing uh, operation by private and big mining corporations uh, contribute a, a significant part on the destruction of the environment and the plunder of natural resources in the Philippines. It uh, increases the vulnerability of our country to the, impact, to the impacts of climate change. As of now, if you could see in this, uh, on the screen, the Philippines, the Philippines is among the top five countries uh, in the world which most affected by the climate disasters. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, only this month, uh, we were uh, hit by uh, actually five uh, typhoons and uh, three of uh, them uh, named Mulabe, Goni, and Banco landed uh, uh, in our uh, uh, country, which have devastated uh, many uh, parts of uh, and provinces, particularly the wool of uh, uh, Luzon. At least uh, the, the government uh, cited that at least 100 people uh, uh, died uh, due to the recent disaster on top of the Bois. Uh, around 1 million uh, people displaced uh, be, be, during the typhoons. Uh, an estimated uh, 11 or more than 11 billion pesos worth of properties, uh, agriculture uh, uh, were, dis were destroyed. The, the screen, uh, the, the flooding that uh, you're uh, seeing on the screen is from Cagayan. Uh, Bali region and uh, from uh, Rizal uh, province, uh, the hardest uh, one of the uh, two of the provinces hardest hit by the typhoons. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, big mining or large scale mining operation contributed a major part in the worsening, env worsening environmental destruction, which again aggravates the impact of disaster in the Philippines. Based on our monitoring, at least 700,000 hectares are currently under mining uh, concession. On the uh, previous slide, uh, uh, in Tagayan region, where uh, it, it is in Tagayan region, where the two big mining uh, or large-scale mining uh, operations are located, this is the Oceana Gold, uh, the Australian Canadian uh, mining company which uh, operates in Nueva Vizcaya. Uh, and another one, a uh, UK-owned company, FCF Minerals, uh, which operates in uh, Quezon, Quirino province. While uh, uh, the, in Rizal province, so, uh, one of the hardest hit uh, communities is the Kasiglahan village in uh, Rodriguez Rizal, where uh, 11 uh, people uh, were killed because of their their communities particular uh, their, their houses were uh, submerged uh, uh, in the flood in the flood uh, uh, the, their area is a resettlement area uh, so the residents are urban poor uh, uh, communities uh, of displaced urban poor uh, from Metro Manila and the uh, rural folks in the Rizal Pump uh, province. In the area, which one uh, factor that contributed to the uh, to that tragedy, um, adjacent to the resettlement area, there were uh, there are seventeen uh, quarrying or small uh, uh, open open uh, surface mining uh, happening in that uh, uh, municipality. Uh, next slide, please. Under the Duterte 
uh, and COVID pandemic, uh, mining uh, situation uh, worsen. It follows the recent uh, observation made by the international NGO and uh, people's organizations, uh, which I uh, uh, yes to life no to mining uh, a part were, was part of this uh, effort. Uh, the following are our major observations. Uh, first, the Duterte government uh, allows the continuing operation of foreign and private mining uh, in spite of the risk uh, and danger of, uh, uh, of COVID. Uh, it employs repressive policies and violence to suppress the opposition's, opposition of the people. Third, big mining is using the pandemic to greenwash uh, themselves as part of COVID solution. Um, and fourth, in cahoots with the national government, the third administration, uh, they are both pu uh, pushing and implementing new policies and uh, mining regulation to further strengthen the mining liberalization or mining plunder uh, in the country. Next, next slide, please. Uh, example is the if you could uh, uh, click the link in the PowerPoint, it will work. No, it's a it's a mining operation in a Homonhon uh, uh, island in eastern uh, Visayas, uh, and during the quarantine period, uh, the local government. Uh, uh, prohibited the entry of a mine, mine uh, Chinese uh, mining ship to uh, uh, get uh, uh, some minerals from the island, uh, nickel, if I remember it right. But the national government allow it to uh, uh, to, to enter the island and uh, start a mining operation. On the right side of the screen, you could see it's a uh, community uh, uh, which uh, a landslide in a community in uh, Quirino in a uh, Quezon municipality of Quezon in Quirino province again uh, this is in uh, Cagayan uh, Valley region uh, it's adjacent to the operation of Oceana Gold in uh, Dipio Nueva Vizcaya uh, 11 or oh, at least uh, Ten people uh, were killed in uh, uh, due to this uh, landslide, and the communities are blaming the operation of FCF, the UK-owned mining company, because they are doing an uh, uh, open pit uh, mining on top of the uh, of the community. Uh, actually, the community is a small-scale mining uh, community, an uh, artisanal uh, mining operation. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, to enforce the mining uh, operation, uh, and in spite of uh, people's uh, uh, opposition and resistance, the government is employing repressive uh, measures. Recently, the anti-terror law was passed last July 2020. Uh, human rights depend uh, defenders and social activists see the law, this this law, uh, to further intensify the uh, violation and uh, worsen the impunity in the country. Uh, as of now, uh, the Philippines is the most dangerous place uh, for environmental defenders uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, you could uh, see the data. Uh, uh, throughout the years and the, the worst uh, or the highest number of killings uh, uh, happened during the administration of uh, Rodrigo Duterte. Um, next slide, please. And this continue uh, even the, there's a uh, health crisis in the country because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, at, uh, we were able to monitor uh, at least 557 environmental defenders, and uh, most of them are anti-mining activists uh, who suffered different human rights uh, violations. Uh, four among them, four were killed 
uh, who uh, some of them are uh, were my colleagues or I work with uh, uh, in in the past. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, the the man on the orange uh, in the uh, uh, with the orange shirt um, who uh, is Jory Porquia. I worked uh, with him. Uh, in mid 2000 uh, uh, to uh, 2000 uh, to oppose a large scale uh, mining operation and we were successful in uh, the island of uh, Panay uh, in the middle is uh, Karandi uh, uh, Randy Echanis a head of a peasant organization in the Philippines uh, he, he, I worked with him the last uh, two years in, uh, promoting environmental agenda uh, in the peace negotiation or peace process uh, uh, in the war, uh, and uh, the revolutionary group, uh, New People's Army in the Philippines. Um, uh, the, the woman, uh, Zara Alvarez, I, <laughs> I worked with her last year in promoting the rights of uh, uh, environmental defenders in the Philippines. We, he, uh, specifically, we particularly organized a uh, press conference and we, she, she attended that uh, conference uh, and last uh, uh, August, uh, he was uh, assassinated uh, uh, when, when, he, when she is uh, going back uh, to her place. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. But uh, despite of the worsening condition, the people uh, campaign and uh, resistance against mining, mining plunder and destruction in the Philippines, uh, in the Philippines continues. Uh, this uh, picture uh, shows uh, indigenous people, uh, children uh, joining a climate strike uh, a few months ago, uh, raising their uh, issues, uh, particularly uh, the, the, the devastation of their uh, their displacement, the uh, the devastation of their uh, 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 communities because of uh, mining and uh, commercial uh, lighting. Next slide, please. Uh, also, there are different uh, forms of uh, resistance to uh, big mining in the Philippines. Uh, uh, communities. Uh, uh, particularly indigenous uh, people's communities and the uh, revolutionary group like the New People's Army are uh, conducting uh, punitive actions. They, 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 they prohibit uh, uh, large-scale mining in their uh, controlled uh, areas, uh, burning of mining equipment and facility and engagement of military and uh, private security of mining corporation continue to happen in different areas in the Philippines. But of course, the Philippine government sees this uh, environmental defense by communities and uh, uh, armed uh, rebel groups in the Philippines as an act of uh, terrorism. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the continuing, uh, uh, I may say, the uh, a successful campaign against large-scale mining is uh, in uh, Nueva Vizcaya which, uh, against the Oceana Gold Operation, which uh, Kaminda will discuss in detail uh, later. Uh, the struggle against the DPO gold mining project started, uh, if I can uh, remember it correctly, in the mid-1990s. Uh, it passed through a series of stages of victories and defeats. Uh, we gained uh, so much uh, experiences and lessons. As of now, uh, more than a year has passed, uh, but the operation of Shana Gold remain uh, suspended. Uh, I will end uh, my my discussion on that. On that, uh, thank you, and uh, again, let us uh, continue to struggle together um, and. Uh, let us win more victories uh, for the people and the environment. Uh, Mabuhay. Salamat po Inting. Thank you. I'm now honoured to introduce uh, two speakers. 
to talk about anti-mining struggles in the Cordillera, which is a mountainous region in the north of the Philippines. So uh, Lulu Gibinez uh, works in the Research and Education Commissions of the Cordillera People's Alliance. Apologies, Lulu, if I didn't get your surname right. Um, yeah, Lulu works in, in the Research and Education Commissions of the Cordillera People's Alliance, uh, which is an independent federation of progressive people's organisations, most of them grassroots based organisations among Indigenous communities in the Cordillera region. Lulu primarily serves Apit Tako, which is in English the Alliance of Peasants in, in that region. Uh, and it's one of the Cordillera People's Alliance's member organisations. Uh, Lulu is joined by uh, Ampi uh, Mangili. Mangili. Mangili, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who also serves with uh, um, Apit Tako. Uh, Lulu and Ampi are veterans of the anti mining struggles in the towns of Itagon and Mankayan, province of Benguet. Um, so over to you, uh, Lulu and Ampi. Can we share our screen? We have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll ask our, um, our hosts uh, if they can make you a, a host. You, sh you should be able to share, I believe. You're a co-host, so just press share below. Yeah, you can do it now. Mm -hmm. Is it there already? Yes. Okay. So we're going to share um, our experiences in the Cordillera in struggling against large mining. Is the audio okay? So this is the Cordillera. Um, we're in Northern Luzon. Here in the provinces of Apayao, Kalinga, Mountain Province, Ifugao, Benguet, and Abra. Actually, the Cordillera also extends to Ilocos um, here. And so some of our anti-mining struggles have been fought in the Ilocos region. Okay. You share a bit of our history. Um, this region has been host to community load and placer mining of gold and copper uh, since 450 years ago, at least. Also, since at least 450 years ago, um, there have been community struggles to defend land and trade routes, um, particularly in the area now known as Benguet. So this is Benguet. Uh, we're from Itogon here near Baguio and Mankayan. The fiercest of these battles were fought in 1623, 1624, and 1759. Um, this is an artist's illustration of the Battle of Tongdo uh, of 1759. Despite the um, vigorous defense of the Cordillera, um, from 1830 to 1840, Spanish colonial forces under Comandante Guillermo Galve succeeded in either decimating or dispersing communities with the use of firearms, fire, and the introduction of smallpox and cholera. So by, 19, by 1856, it became possible for a Spanish company to open a large copper mine in Mankayan Benguet. The mining operations were, however, short-lived. Cordillerans contributed to the overthrow of the Spanish colonial regime and the establishment of Filipino revolutionary governments in both the Cordillera and Ilocos regions. But the revolutionary government of Benguet fell to US colonial forces in 1900. US soldiers immediately embarked on mineral prospecting in Benguet, where they had indigenous, they had seen indigenous gold and copper works. Um, this is the grinding of gold ore um, in Itogon, uh, as documented by American mining prospectors. Mm -hmm. And this is the smelting 
of copper ore um, documented by American explorers in Mangkayan. By 1903, the Americans were able to open the first successful large mining operations in the Cordillera. Uh, our photograph shows the first cyanidation mill uh, built in 1904 in the municipality of Itogon. It so happened that at this time, the local communities were no longer very interested in mining. They were preoccupied with agricultural development and unaware of the impact large mining would have on their young wet rice culture, the communities left the prospectors and mine developers alone. By 1928, however, it became clear to them that mining in the style and scale of the Americans would ruin their land and water sources. Thus, the communities launched their first protests. This was a protest against the takeover of Benguet Corporation of one of the major irrigation sources in the municipality of Itogon. Despite the protest from, 1900, from the 1900s to the 1930s, the Americans were able to open a total of 14 mining operations. 11 of these would later be consolidated under three big firms, Benguet Corporation, Lepanto Consolidated, and Itogon Suyo. The three firms also logged pine forests extensively for mine timber. Um, this shows the mining compound of Lepanto Consolidated and the um, um, sawmill of the um, of Benguet Corporation held, held Dumbo. Word of the destruction wrought by large mining spread throughout the Cordillera. In the 1930s, mineral prospecting expanded to Bontoc, where there was a 400-year-old wet rice culture. So resistance here was immediate. Since then, large mining has failed to expand beyond Benguet. Well, successful large mining anyway. Uh, there was expansion, but it failed. Um, for a brief interlude lasting from 1981 to 1985, uh, the Marcos dictatorship was able to open and operate the Batong Buhay mine in the province of Kalinga. The New People's Army forced the closure of the Batong Buhay operations by blowing up its power source. Meanwhile, in Benguet, uh, the people caught the deterioration of their land and livelihood uh, and endured the continued operations of large mining firms until the 1980s, when the people of Itogon rose up against open pit and underground bulk mining, because it would have meant um, the collapse of the surface where the people lived. Felix Mining Corporation, established in 1956, had been doing bulk mining in the neighboring towns of Tuba and Tublay since the late 1970s, now Benguet Corporation wanted to do the same in Itogon. So from 1988 to 1996, the communities put up human barricades and succeeded in limiting open pit mining to Benguet Corp's Antamok mine, also underground bulk mining to Itogon Suyok's Sangilo mine. Um, these photos show the barricade at, um, around Antamok uh, where people stood in front of bulldozers and confronted um, mining company employees and stopped their entry into the um, uh, communities. Twice mass arrests were made, but the barricaders were eventually set free. Too small to remain profitable, both the Antamok and Sangilo operations closed in 1999. In Mangkayan, however, Lepanto was able to convert to block caving operations without incident until 1999 when it expanded and intensified production and met with widespread community protest. Um, this photo shows the tailings dam of Lepanto in the background and um, the mountainside 
a mountainside in Mangkayan which collapsed uh, because of the expansion of the um, tailings dam. So that's our history in broad strokes. And uh, now we go to what's been happening since 1995. So uh, upon the region was flooded with Uh, MP, we, we can't hear you. There seems to be some problem with the sound. Yeah, we have problem with the connection, Andrew. Uh -huh. Connection problem. Can you communicate with them with WhatsApp or any sort? Any, any mean? Uh, no. Um. Or, or meantime, they connect with... Sorry, everyone. Um, it's the internet. <laughs> um, Lulu, are you, are you still with us? Lulu, are you still there? No. Is this Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, it'd be wise to go on. They may try. It looks like they're they've dropped out so they might try to connect again in the next few minutes uh it's coming in again yeah all right let's um i'll just ask everyone to bear with us for a few minutes because i'm reluctant to interrupt their presentation in the middle before going on to the third speaker um i'm just looking through they, they back but um what we can do in the meantime, um, I guess I can just try to um, fill in for a bit. I've I've found that this uh, these talks fascinating so far, and what's what I it was news to me was how early the Americans uh, started mining after they invaded the Philippines. That that was really news to me. Um, the other thing that struck me so far is the use of uh, human barricades how, how that's been a practice for many years and and i'm sure we'll hear later that's a key uh, tactic that's uh, been used in didipio against oceana gold um, but i hope um, that we now have um, lulu and umpi back are you there lulu umpi okay I um I think we, we will need to go oh is it They're okay back. now? Yes, we we can hear you clearly. We are now in since the uh, the mining act of nineteen ninety-five. So upon immediately the approval of the mining act. Cordillera administrative region was with a flooded full with mineral, mineral explorations and mining applications from firms based in Australia, uh, the New Crest, the US, the Newmont, and Canada. The Cordillera People's Alliance launched an education and information campaign. The leaders of Togan communities, like Ampi. <laughs> ah, so I was born in Togan. I'm uh, we played a key role in helping other communities understand the impact of mining projects and plan the anti-mining actions uh, as far as uh, the Mindanao affected by mining they came to Itogon and we shared experiences our, on our struggles against mining operations. By the year 2002, the biggest of the applicants, Climax Saremco, Newcrest and Newmont had pulled out of the Cordillera. So they have the biggest applications through the Financial Technical Assistance Agreement. But after the Makapagal Arroy government, they issued a national minerals policy in 2004. 
other corporations either took over their mining claims or filed new claims. By the year? At present. Yeah. At present, currently, uh, claims currently cover 746,968 hectares, more than 40% of the Cordillera Salad area. So, so these are the mining applications in the region. So with the total mineral claims to 7746 and 968. Uh, our major struggles, so in 2006 and 2013, Cordillera Exploration Corporations Incorporated, known as the SEXI, established by the Anglo-American, taken over by Nickel Asia and Apayao and Kalinga. So, uh, the people protest these uh, mining operations. In 2000, 2007 and 2008, uh, we protested the anvil mining in Benguet. So they, they did not push through with their uh, mining operations. Also in 2007, in 2011, we stopped the Royal Co., the Australian company, and back on Benguet. In 2010, in 2013, the Golden Lake in Abra, so that is again our one of the, our major protests in Abra. Again, in 2011 and 2014, uh, we protested against the Makilala in Malibatu, the subsidiaries of Pilk Dodge, Freeport Makuran in Ilocosur Mountain Province and Kalinga. 2011 to present, we are currently protesting the expansion of the Lipanto and Gold Pits and Mangkayan Benguet. 2012 and 2013, the Baron River dredging in Apayao. So they've tried to mine uh, the river system in Apayao. So the people there also protested the dredging uh, attempt. 2000 and present, the SEXI or the Cordillera Exploration, uh, Exploration Incorporation in Lucusor, Benguet, Ipugao, and the Mountain Province in Abra. So they never succeeded in uh, continuing their uh, mining operations. Uh, we would like also to, like share, to share a little detail yeah, about these our our major struggles. So in six in Apayao in Kalinga, uh, they have started really their uh, exploration work. Uh, but the people there uh, started protesting their uh, uh, mining exploration. The, the sexy got a local warl warlord in the provincial government to collude with, to collude with it. So in Apayao, they hired goons from among from the members of the extortionist Cordillera People's Liberation Army. In Kalinga, they got the Philippine Army unit assigned to the area to serve as its security forces. Used above to try and force its exploration projects on communities, but communities in corner united against these projects. So that is the sexy experience in uh, Apayao and Kalinga. Um, the people of Connor also took their cause to uh, the uh, shareholders of Anglo-American uh, and to the UK public. And this was a major source of pressure uh, against uh, SEXI. SEXI was forced to limit its exploration works to one small site in Connor, Apayao, and another in Balbadan, Kalinga, before it finally pulled out. Now we'll go to Anvil Mining. This is another Australian firm. Uh, this is one Australian firm uh, which entered here in 2007 <coughs> and attempted to reoperate and expand Itogon Suyok's Sangilo Mine. Um, it tried to assure the communities that their water sources would not be affected by exploration drilling 
uh, by presenting hydro hydrological data that the local people refuted using their lay knowledge as mining communities of the character and conditions of the area's subsurface. Um, the drilling of exploration holes in this area, in the Anvil area, would have uh, destroyed several water sources uh, on which um, two barangays of Itogon uh, relied heavily. Uh, it would have destroyed the wet rice culture of Barangay Ampukao and deprived the mining communities of uh, Ampukao and the poblacion of Itogon of their water source. Mm. Anvil employed social scientists to liaison with the communities and persuade them to consent to the project. But this failed, um, even though the social scientists worked for two years to try and convince the people. The communities guarded the exploration drilling sites against the entry of Anvil and drove off the company's men. Um, so this was a successful struggle and Anvil was uh, forced to pull out in 2008. Then a second Australian company entered also in 2007, uh, Royal Co, um, which tried to operate in Gambang, Bakun, Benguet. So uh, it was a big uh, mining, uh, mining operation supposed to be. Uh, the, com uh, the Royal Co used uh, some of the villagers to go with uh, in favor of them. But the 500 community elders consulted. So they, they voted 450 against and 49 in favor plus one who have abstained. The Royal Court adopted the tactic of dividing consent solicitation in three phases. Both of phase one, landowners by renting their land at 3,000 pesos drill hold per month. Phase two and phase three communities protested. So the, mobilizing up to 500 persons at a time to demand that the provincial government of Benguet and the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples to stop the drilling. When protest actions in the provincial capital brought no results, community communities barricaded against the entry of the Royal, Royal Co to drill rigs into phase two and three. All families and the communities participated by the rotation so that the barricades could be manned by up to 80 persons at a time. Congressional inquiry was conducted, but this came late. By, by this time, Royal Co had decided to give up phase two and phase three. Soon afterwards, it pulled out from the area. Then in 2010, we had another experience, this time with a local mining company, uh, Golden Lake. Um, this was owned by a petty warlord from Negros, who, with whom the local petty warlords in Abra um, colluded to try and force communities to give their consent to a large mining project. Facing these warlords and their goons, as well as the soldiers of the Philippine army who were assigned to the area, the communities asserted their right to free and prior informed consent. But the goons and the army interfered with the FDIC process, uh, eventually succeeding in coercing four communities to grant consent to Golden Lake. The remaining communities, however, persisted in their protest until it became uneconomical for Golden Lake to go on with the project. In 2011, um, the South American company Goldfields uh, joined up with Lepanto on uh, another mining project. So there was a partnership uh, with Lepanto and the Goldfields to extend its uh, mining operations along Malkayan in parts of Pugias and, uh, and uh, underlying communities of uh, Kibungan. With a, with a hefty financial investment and expert technical support 
from gold fields, the Panto targeted the deep mining of an ore deposit with an old claim that they had never succeeded in exploiting. Not even with it broke in Rail Tinto in 1994. It called this the Far Southeast Gold Project. When gold fields tried to start drilling in 2011, the Mangkayan community of Sabak immediately put up a human barricade to stop the entry of its drill rig. Gold fields brought drill rig up to the mountain to Tabiu. The communities around the area put up another barricade. The Panto and gold fields brought in the, brought in the National Commission on These Peoples, the NCIP, to secure Formal, con formal consent for the project. So this is a picture where the people um, lines are protest rally against uh, the CIP decision. The NCIP bailed the participation of indigenous communities that are actually affected by the project and got a paid FPIC from an affected communities and from the migrant mine workers. So uh, it was a resounding uh, protest or no for the Lepanto in Goldfield, but they were able to take some of the unaffected communities and mine workers. At the same time, the Lepanto filed charges against 100 participants in Tabio uh, Barricade. So, and uh, despite the cases filed uh, with the barricaders, still the barricade continued until uh, 2013. Exposure of the anomaly of the FPIC process and acquittal of the barricade participations drove Lipanto and Goldfields to seek relief from the court. Lipanto argued that its claim to the parcel is gold or value predated that Indigenous Peoples Right Act of 1997 and was therefore exempt from the requirement of the FPIC process from the Indigenous communities, but affected by its project to mine this whole body. In 2019, the court uh, ruled in favor of Lepanto. But Lepanto and gold fields have remained unable to implement their power south is gold project until today. Um, as of now, the currently uh, active mining application is from SEXI uh, in the Southern Cordillera. Um, this project is um, very large. It covers more than 76,000 hectares um, in five provinces, Benguet, Ilocos Sur, Abra, the Mountain Province, and Ifugao. Sexy is owned by Nickel Asia, uh, which is a partnership between some ex-cronies of the dictator Ferdinand Marcos and the Japanese company Sumitomo. Resistance has been most intense in Ilocos Sur, where Sexy started to secure the FPIC of indigenous communities in 2016. Um, there was a maneuver that was allowed by NCIP uh, instead of seeking consent from the whole community, uh, from all the communities and from each community as a whole, um, SEXI was allowed to seek consent from only the elders uh, and to get them to sign the consent forms in individually. But this did not work because first, the people insisted on their right to decide on the project as communities and second, a majority of the elders opposed the project anyway. This forced Nickel Asia to break up its project into several sections, uh, following the example of royal cost facing of its Gambang project. It has not yet secured FPIC from any section. Um, these are the experiences um, we've had and um, our lessons our lesson from these experiences is that um, the courts, NCIP, uh, the mining companies, uh, 
all their resources are stacked against our people. But um, as long as we are determined, in fact, even if we're divided <laughs> sometimes, we can still prevail, uh, we can still overcome um, what the mining companies uh, set up against us. Okay. Uh, salamat po sa inyong dalawa. Uh, thank you very much for that great uh, presentation. Uh, we might be having some problems with our uh, third speaker connecting. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that I can introduce our final speaker, M Minda Dumang. Um, Marfel, I saw you sent a chat saying that there was some problem with the phone. Can you let me know if they're able to connect? That's my feel. Sorry, everyone, just bear with us. Um, I should say that um, Minda is dialing in from um, Didipio, which is the um, community uh, that's been badly affected by Oceana Gold's mine. And it's, it's quite a remote area. I imagine that they may have some difficulties because of that. Um, so please bear with us. I might ask, Marfell, are you able to unmute your mic and just let me know whether you, how you're going with that? Um, Can I, I suggest that we watch a film maybe while you're working it out? Want me yeah, to do that? yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Nat. Do you want to just introduce the next one, Andrew? And I'll show it. Um, yeah, I'd love to if I know what it is. Which which one are you going to show, Nat? Uh, the second one on the run sheet. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is... Um, called uh, Dunham, uh, which is English water, and it's another nice, really nice bit of music.
Okay, we're, we're back, uh, and um, I'm not quite sure, we, we, I'm not, not sure that we've solved our problems connecting to Didipio. I wonder if someone could tell me. There's a message uh, from Elena Ka Kalingayan. Does anyone know if that's Minda? Yes. Uh, Manang Minda, you can unmute your mic. Me? Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. So, yeah, she's already uh, here. Excellent. I'll, I'll introduce uh, our third speaker. Welcome, Minda. Um, excuse me while I find my notes. So, uh, yeah, once again, I'm honoured to introduce another great speaker. Our final speaker tonight is uh, Minda Dumang. Mm -hmm. uh, Minda is the chairperson of Sapakmi which is the Association for the Rights of Indigenous Farmers and Workers. <laughs> so, so Pakmi is one of the pioneers of the struggle against Oceana Gold and a member of uh, Punganai, the Kagayan Valley Indigenous Peoples Alliance. Um, Minda is a proud Tuwali, so that's Minda, that's the way we do these kind of introductions for Indigenous people in Australia. Uh, Minda's a, a proud Tuwali, uh, one of the um, Ifugao uh, First Nations people in the north of the Philippines and Minda's an important leader in the struggle to defend the DPO from the abuses of Australian mining company Oceana Gold. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Minda. Hello, it's okay? Yeah, sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all of you, sir, madam. Thank you for this opportunity to see and speak to you through this Zoom. But first, we would like to extend our gratitude to all for lending your continuous support and most of all your prayer. Indeed, without you, we did not reach this level that we want to be. In this more than one year of barricading, we have experienced a lot of difficulties like harassment, intimidation, and some of us were threatened online and offline, and many more. But because of your help and advice, it, advices, it gives courage and strength for us to stand and continue our fight. In our struggle, many times, the Oceana Gold tried to deliver tanks of diesel, and sometimes they're accompanied by the PNP. But with the unity and the strength of the people, we were able to block them. There were even MGB and DNR came and talked to us to allow the entry, but we never backed down. But, um, okay. But last uh, April 6, 2020, they were forced to deliver through the help of the PNP of the Nueva Vizcaya and Carino province who joined together. So there are hundreds PNP, yet we are but only few because of the pand pandemic that time. We follow the protocol to stay home because the whole region uh, too were in GCQ at that time. But this Oceana Gold took the chance to deliver three tanker of diesel guided by those hundreds of PNP. And the PNP filed a case against the 13 indigenous people, including me. But despite of that, the indigenous people continue their barricading. We have done protests, dialogues, past documents, local and national, IEC to different barangays. So because of our barricade, the Oceana Gold to suspend its full operation. In a more than one year barricading, we also had sacrifices that most of the time we left our families. Our small children left alone and some of us abandoned our farm. We did this because we want to protect and defend our homeland. The effect of the mining 
is the water pollution, air pollution, and depletion of water, cracking of soil, land erosion, and it divides the principle of the people. Even the good relationship, it divides them, and many more. And what is happening here this time, a few days ago, the Oceana Gold want to deliver five tons of diesel. Uh, November, last November 19. And the three tanks were uh, arrived, uh, arrived here in the Verona monitoring camp. While two tanks left in uh, Barangay de Bibi, Carino province at that day, all employees of the Oceana Gold and uh, D Corp employees and their families came to the monitoring camp to wait the tanker to guide to the ocean side. They plan everything they do, but they failed because of the of our governor, Carlos Padilla, we thank him, called our barangay captain that his executive order still existing. So they explained to the SOP of the PNP. So the SOP explained, but the pro mining start shouting and utter many bad words to us, including our barangay officials. Now, Shana Gold, attorney Karina, was with them. And the road here in the DPU via municipality to Casibu and to uh, province of Nueva Vizcaya was closed due to the tailings dam of the Oceana Gold. It submerged. So, so we demand at this point. Uh, our stand for more than one year expiration of the Oceana Gold, of the FTA of the Oceana Gold. We, the Samahang Pangkarapatan ng Katutubong Magsasaka at Manggagawa Incorporation, urge our government officials to do the very ultimate action for the total closure of this Oceana Gold, the rehabilitation, the indemnity of damages, and we ask to our president, Rodrigo Roa Duterte, to please not to renew the FTAA of the Oceana Gold. And uh, we are uh, begging your continuous as our supporter, are your assistance, and your, of course, your financial support, because we need to our monitoring camp. So I hope that, uh, uh, so I hope, we hope that uh, we, uh, that, that this uh, uh, Zoom will, uh, uh, will marinig, you know, marinig ng ating uh, Pangulo, our president will hear uh, because of you, that you are going to help us, that uh, he's, he is not going to renew the FTAA of the Oceana Gold. So Oceana Gold out now, save Nueva Vizcaya. Thank you and God bless you. Uh, Mafel? <laughs> yes, maraming salamat, Minda. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, look, as someone who's worked on a PASSES campaign in solidarity with the people of TDPO, I, I really enjoyed hearing from, from Minda, one of the campaign's leaders. It's really it's a, exciting for me to meet someone um, who uh, is uh, a frontline defender, so to speak. So, thank you so much. Uh, we also have a short video to that explains a little bit more about um what's going on in ddpr and, and the terrible things that um ashana gold are doing i have have done um so i might ask um our technical expert i think it's nat in this case to, to show that video can you kick that off nat yeah we can uh send to Mafel because we are uh, 
yeah, may, may, maybe we will send to Mofel, but uh, thanks, sir, not this time. It's okay. Uh, hey, okay naman po. Si, si Nat ang bahala dyan. Okay. Na, 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 Natalie, can, can you start, start the video? Okay, so look, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed that uh, video and it got a better understanding of some of the things that are going on in the DPO. So we'll now um, move on to uh, our open forum section, but before that, um, I would like to uh, let everyone know that PASS has just released a report summarising Oceana Gold's abuses into DPO and we'd like to share that with everyone here today. So I'll, I'll ask our event team to post that in a Zoom chat. I, I believe they can put the report as an attachment in, in the chat there and, and uh, anyone can download it. So please feel free to download that document. That's uh, it's called um, Oceana Gold into DPO and just please use the chat if you have any difficulties trying to download that. Uh, one more thing before we start the Q&A uh, discussion, uh, just another reminder about our Cyclone Relief Fundraiser um, and um, I wonder, Martin, could you chuck the slide up one one last time with the um, cyclone relief uh, f appeal details, uh, and um, also put put it in the chat one more time. So once again, please give generously to that. Um, so the, the other thing I'd like to do before we start the discussion is uh, to acknowledge some of the elders and leaders who are here tonight. Um, and I will mention um, the ones that I, I know about. So apologies if, if I miss um, anyone just because I'm not a, aware that they're here. Um, I've got two people to to mention. Um, uh, Dominic Waikanak, um, it's, a, it's an honour to have Dominic here today. He's 
um, Greens councillor with Waverley City Council, that's Bondi Ward in, in Sydney, uh, and a former, former deputy mayor. And Dominic's a, a proud Torres Strait and South Sea Islander born on um, Uibara country. Dominic, you can correct me when you speak if I got that wrong, near Mackay in Queensland. Uh, and the other uh, person that we have here tonight uh, um, is uh, Kevin Kevin Bracken. And I'd like to mention uh, Kevin's uh, chairperson of the International League of People's Struggle. Uh, he's the chair of the Spirit of Eureka, former secretary of Victorian Trades Hall Council and the Maritime Union of Australia, the Victorian branch. Uh, and Kevin's a key leader in the campaign to hold Oceana Gold to account uh, and importantly organise monthly demonstrations outside the Oceana Gold offices here in, in Melbourne for many years. Uh, and so to uh, open the discussion, um, I, I might, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Dominic um, to respond with any uh, comments or questions or solidarity statements um, so uh, over to you, Dominic. I hope you can unmute your mic. Uh, it looks like Dominic's... How's that? Uh, okay, great. Is that better? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. First of all, I'd like to pay my respects to elders and country and pay my respects to the, the elders and the country of the uh, Indigenous people who have contributed to this online session today and to the Indigenous people for all those different struggles that the information we have received today has covered. And I would like to also express uh, solidarity with our Indigenous brothers and sisters in the Philippines, for all the Indigenous country there and express solidarity for their struggles against these mining companies. And also let them know that our struggles here in our colonised country also mirrors the struggles of Indigenous people across the globe often against mining companies using the same tactics. So on behalf of our context, I, I wish them all the best uh, in what they are doing now and into the future with their struggles to maintain their battles and their communities against the uh, repression and the poison that mining companies bring to our communities. I uh, just also like to say uh, in the information that I've seen spoken about this afternoon that it's interesting to see that the same tactics are used across the globe and, and have been used through the colonial process here in Australia. Uh, people might know that this year there was a focus of 250 years after the Indigenous sovereignty of this country first came face to face with the colonial agenda in the form of a lieutenant known as Captain Cook 250 years ago. So we have focused on these things again this year, talking about our sovereignty and our ongoing struggles against uh, mining companies and the repression of our people. You might have seen that in a lot of countries, including our own, there have been marches in the street against the uh, Black Lives Matter cause, and for us called the uh, Stop Black Deaths in Custody cause. So these struggles are common, I think, to our people across the world. And it's interesting to hear in the information that smallpox was used early in the history of some of the places that we have heard about, as it was here early in the, the 1700s, as a way to uh, to beat the Indigenous people and to make way for the colonial process that was to come after that. In uh, Australia, we uh, obviously, I don't think, faced the 
amount of brutality and uh, aggression from mining security, private security, and from uh, bodies like the, the PNP. Uh, we do face obviously struggles against the police here, but from what I've seen, uh, not to the extent that uh, I have seen presented to us from our brothers and sisters this afternoon. So again, I say thank you for maintaining your struggle in the face of this repression and this violence and brutality. Uh, we have groups here like Lock the Gate, which is a, a group formed to uh, similar to the human barricades that I've, I've heard about here this afternoon of people meeting those mining companies at the gates of uh, what is often uh, private property, but also what we call crown land here, which is national parks and reserve land that we wish to see kept as uh, pristine as it can, as environments are allowed to be under uh, the colonial process here. So there is a similar thing here, but again, not to the extent that I've seen expressed by our people uh, joining this call this afternoon. So uh, again, solidarity, and thank you for being brave in the face of all this uh, violence. And uh, uh, if there is anything that we can do, and I've thought of lots of different ideas of ways we can help here with especially those Australian-based mining companies. Um, I live in an area here where we're close to the, the Sydney um, business district. Um, so the stock exchange as the representative of uh, all companies is not so far away from where we are. And in Bondi Junction, which is close to where I am, there is a base for an organisation called the Australian Shareholders Association and after what happened in our country here, uh, that was perpetrated by Rio Tinto, where they blew up one of our uh, sacred sites in Western Australia, there has been renewed focus from our people here about how we uh, meet these mining companies and meet them in a way that I've seen people doing in the Philippines this afternoon. And that is by meeting uh, their um, businesses, not only doing action on the ground at the gate, where the drilling is taking place, but also taking up the opportunity to bring to shareholders' attention and bring those mining companies into media focus so that their work is seen as disreputable and using that energy to make people shift their investments into more positive uh, commercial transactions and out of a brutal mining sector. So again, solidarity, if there's anything we can do to help here, please let us know. Thank you. Th thanks so much, uh, Dominic. Um, does anyone on the panel uh, want to respond? I think it's it's really interesting to hear those uh, uh, Dominic draw out those common themes and some really um, touch on some really general issues there as well uh, of colonialism and and so on and those expressions of solidarity. Um, yeah, I wonder, uh, Nteng Lulu or Ampi or Minda, did, did you want to jump in at any point? Feel free, but. If not, because I'm sure there are um, people who are um, keen to get into specifics. And just look, if you want to jump in, Nting, or anyone, just speak away, talk over me, because I don't really see too well. Yes, Andrew. Um, uh, first, uh, uh, we want to recognize the contribution of uh, Australian uh, solidarity groups. Uh, you mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, Spirit of Eureka, PASA, ILPS Australia, uh, Migrante, APDP, and there are different and many more uh, people's organization NGOs in Australia that uh, supported our campaign, not only uh, against Oshana Gold, but uh, different uh, uh, mining uh, corporations operating in the Philippines, and um, uh, the, the the recent uh, defeat or loss of Oshana Gold in the Philippines is just one of the victories of this uh, solidarity campaign between the people of uh, Philippines and uh, Australia. And we also know that uh, the, the Australian group supported the uh, people of. Uh, 
El Salvador in uh, kicking out also Shana Gold in uh, their place. So um, uh, we, we want to highlight that, that uh, we, uh, uh, we were able to have this uh, gains or victory. Uh, of course, keys the, the, the resistance of the community in Didipio, Nebamskaya, uh, but without the support of the international, particularly the people and organizations uh, also in I think it will be harder for us to achieve this kind of uh, experience and lessons. Thank you. Thanks, Enting. Um, I might go now to uh, Kevin Bracken. Kevin, to see if you've got any comments or, or maybe perhaps you might have some questions to kick off and we've also got a few questions in in, in the um in the chat and so on that we can come to but um yeah kevin did you want to um make a comment or say a few words oh by mute uh, sorry mate yeah no worries the, uh, microphone off um, I was um, surprised and, um, and, and encouraged by Lulu and Ampi's um, history of the Philippine, Filipino people stopping mining companies. It's a long, proud history that you have over there. And it just goes to show the courage of the people. You know, you're battling, you know, the army, the police, um, as well as the environmental, you know, the, the typhoons that have just come through there recently. And you still kept that barricade going. So we, we became involved with Oceana Gold when they were trying to sue the, the um, El Salvador government for $300 million because they wouldn't give them a mining permit. They lost their case. They had to pay compensation to El Salvador. It wasn't enough. It wasn't what it, paid, what it cost them to defend it. But El Salvador later became the first company in the world to ban all metalliferous mining. And it happened that um, Carlos Padilla, the governor of Nevada Vizcaya, was in the, in the El Salvador parliament at that time. And I think it really encouraged him to come back and um, the local government's the one who's actually stopping them, doesn't want the permit to go ahead too. So I hope that uh, the national government recognises and revokes, um, recognises the wishes of the people, that the prior, free and prior consent was never given from the people of um, the DPO to, for the mine to operate in the first place. And it's been operating illegally and I hope that they um, get that it um, is shut down by Duterte. Um, and Mender, it was great to hear from you. For twelve over twelve months, you've kept the mine shut. I think it was June last year. The mining, uh, the license expired. You've kept that barricade going. So full marks to the, the people who've kept that uh, the people's barricade going. We have given a little bit of financial support. I was embarrassed about how little it was, but it's, it was something anyway. But I know we'll um, try and get some more money over to you. But also, anyone who's interested in Melbourne, is next Wednesday, the 2nd of December, we're, we're um, protesting again at the Oceana Gold's offices at 357 Collins Street. So anyone who's around in Melbourne at that time, it'd be great to get you down there and give support to our brothers and sisters in the Philippines to make, sure, make Oceana Gold do the right thing, clean up their mess in the Philippines and get out of the place. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I want to go to some of the, the questions now that we've got from the, the chat. And, um, uh, and, and it looks like we're going well for time. So I might go just go through some of these questions and we might even be able to uh, open the forum up um, but, uh, to people just to, to ask their questions. Um, but I'll, I'll go through these first. Um, so there's a simple question I see here, who are the PNP? I can answer that. It's the Philippine National Police. Um, and then we've got a question from uh, Peter Murphy, who I should also uh, acknowledge as, as being um, one of the leaders in, in solidarity with the Philippines. Um, Peter is the leader of the of Paul, the Philippine Australia Union Links, and also, um, uh, no, forgive me, Peter, for not knowing your um, title in iChirp, but one of the key leaders of the of the international um, campaign for human rights in the Philippines. 
So I might give you a chance to speak a bit later, but for now, I'll just read this question that you've put here. Um, during the pandemic lockdowns, uh, was Oceana Gold able to restart any operations? I'll put that to the panel. Maybe in that would respond to the question. Is that is that you ending? We can't hear you. Are oh, you on mute? Yeah, uh, it would be better if Minda could uh, respond because uh, she's on the ground, but if uh, she can, uh, I could uh, add something. Anyway, I have a problem uh, with her connection. Um, as far as we know, there, there is no legal basis for Oceano Gold to operate uh, uh, in the DPO since uh, but at the same time, the national government, particularly the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, is very complacent and and uh, actually recommended the, the, the continuation of operation of uh, Oceano Gold despite this, uh, uh, despite the absence of a uh, uh, legal uh, agreement for Oceano Gold to do so. Um, the entry of uh, uh, fossil uh, fuel or diesel uh, into the uh, mining uh, area is an indication that the uh, Oceana Gold uh, is partly operating, particularly in their underground mining operation. Uh, uh, a group of these uh, recently, Oceana Gold, uh, uh, are existing to, uh, to transport uh, gold ores, which we suspect uh, they were able to extract during the COVID uh, uh, period. Again, uh, this should not be the case if the national government is weak in implementing, suspending the operation of Oceano Gold. Um, we, also, the, uh, the local government uh, unit, particularly the provincial government, uh, uh, strictly uh, opposed, is, uh, is opposing the, the, the continuation of the uh, mining operation of uh, Oceano Thanks, uh, Nting. Um, I, I have a, a question um, relating to the free prior and informed consent. And again, I'd be happy for any of the panelists to to talk about this. Um, but it, it it struck me it strikes me as something strange in the law there that um, uh, communities are, are protected. Um, and they have the right to, to free prior and informed consent if they're if they have ancestral domain if they're indigenous people um, but what what surprises me is that I, I'm don't not aware that there's any law that requires other communities to or that gives other communities the right to um, uh, give free prior and informed consent. Uh, so I'm just wondering if, um, if that can be explained a, a little little bit more. It's great that um, uh, Indigenous communities are, are protected because mining companies under law need to seek free prior and informed com consent. But what about communities that, that can't claim that uh, link to ancestral domain? That's precisely the problem in DDPO. Um, 
the problem in DDPO is that the communities living there are not really indigenous to the area. They are migrants from Ifugao and other provinces, uh, then get included. And so they were not allowed to exercise uh, free and prior informed consent. Um, the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples did not recognize uh, their right to this. Actually, the government is fickle about free and prior informed consent, um, or rather, it's arbitrary uh, when, when the government thinks that it will be in its favor to secure FPIC uh, from the people, then it says, okay, seek FPIC. But um, when they know that the people won't give free and prior informed consent, then um, they deny the right to this. For Like what happened in Mangkayan uh, when the court ruled against the, the decision of the people uh, saying that Goldfields and Lepanto did not need the FPIC of the people because they already got the mining claim before the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act was passed. Um, it, it's like that. Uh, there's a lot of impunity uh, when it comes to mining. Um, the government really favors large miners and maneuvers its way around its own laws. Thank you, Lily. Mm -hmm. oh, you, do you have more on that, Lily? Yes. I don't know you, if you want more explanation. <laughs> no, that's but a great let explanation. Let me just add to that. Yeah. yeah, go on. Yes, OK. In relation to the um, FPIC in the DP, while it's true that the communities uh, living in the DP right now are not indigenous to the place, but actually, they are still considered as um, ICC or the Indigenous Cultural Communities. So actually, they can still assert the right to uh, free prior and informed consent. However, yeah, be, uh, just what uh, Lulu mentioned, uh, the, the, the NCIP, the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, decided you know, not to um, uh, process the FPIC in the DPO just because the people there are uh, migrants, but actually uh, the people can still assert their rights to FPIC. Uh, if, because they, they have been living um, in the DPU for actually uh, it's more than uh, 50 years now. So they also have the right to the, to the area. But of course, well, it's again the decision of the NCIP not to include the people of the DPO in the process of FPIC. Um, if, you, if you really follow history, you will recognize that the Ifugao there and the Benguet people there have ancestral rights to the area because that's traditional expansion area for Ifugaos and um, the Ibaloy of Benguet and the Kalamuya. Um, the thing is, in our in Philippine law, it's only the um, defined ancestral domain that's recognized. Expansion areas are not recognized. So even the roaming areas of the um, of the first first the Aboriginal peoples, uh, their roaming areas are not that clearly recognized by law. If you establish an ancestral domain, it's like they limit you to, to this small place and your expansion area is not recognized as part of your uh, ancestral uh, scope. So if we were to go back, way, way back in history, we would recognize that the Ifugao and the Benguet peoples have rights in Nueva Vizcaya. Um, they should really uh, uh, be, be asked for consent. 
Great. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Lulu. Um, we, we might come back to to some of that detail later and talk more about Oceana Gold. The, the, we've got a question here um, about the killings and human rights abuses, and that's um, clearly a, one of the um, biggest problems associated with, with mining and, and land grabs. Um, this is from, from uh, Peter um, Mellons, who uh, should mention as one of the, the hard hard workers uh, in the Blockade IMARC um, Alliance Organising Committee has contributed a huge amount to organising this conference. And uh, Peter uh, asks, uh, in, and this is in relation to Enteng's speech uh, about the pattern of killings, um, whether it's it's general or or house or just in Voro mining protests. And I guess Enteng, you could perhaps expand on on the the pattern of killings and human rights abuses. Um, Enteng, would you like to? Answer that question. Yeah, also Lulu and uh, Atika uh, could contribute. Uh, there's a widespread uh, and targeted uh, attack on the villages coming from the state uh, to steeple the opposition of the people, not only to mining, but also uh, to the different policies projects of uh, the government which uh, not only uh, affect the environment but uh, uh, cause uh, massive uh, displacement uh, uh, to the people, uh, particularly the issue of uh, land grabbing. Uh, the pattern is uh, uh, whenever there's a strong campaign or a position at the local level, the leaders and activists are being led tag or uh, how do you say this uh, 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 red tagging uh, we, uh, here in the Philippines uh, Philippine means uh, uh, an individual are being uh, linked to uh, rebel groups or and uh, and uh, uh, being uh, accused of being uh, terrorists. No, of a uh, part of terrorist organization. And this will happen for some time. And uh, 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 if the uh, organizations and uh, individuals uh, did not stop uh, in their advocacy, uh, uh, sometimes they were killed. As, a, as in the case I, I presented earlier, Zara, uh, Jory Portilla, and then even uh, different uh, activists in Cordillera. And uh, right now, uh, I think Kaminda, her colleagues, and uh, Sapakmin and her organization are being red tag as a front of the New People's Army. And uh, given, with, uh, given uh, there's a uh, new law, uh, I mentioned earlier, earlier the anti terror law, though we are still questioning it from uh, the Supreme Court. It's not yet fully uh, being implemented. Uh, uh, this open uh, uh, a lot, uh, this will, will lead to more abuses, abuses uh, victimizing uh, not only the activists, but uh, uh, the common people who are just uh, defending their rights, defending their rights, uh, Depending on their communities. So, uh, uh, the, the, the human rights violations uh, among environmental defenders is just uh, a part of the overall uh, impunity in the Philippines. Thank you, Enteng. Uh, can you come back to um, Oshana Gold, there's a question here asking about the current status of Oshana Gold's FTAA, which um, I might explain is the financial uh, and technical assistance agreement. Um, and and I'm just for um, general information, the 
the interesting thing in the in the history here and the way that Oshana Gold entered the DPO is that the national government, um, I think it was in 1995, issued this FTAA, which is like a large agreement, almost a mining permit to Oshana Gold. Um, that was before, um, and I'd be interested to have the panel correct me and, and elaborate on this, before they even started talking, Oshana Gold started seeking permission from anyone in the DPO, um, they had been given the, this agreement from the national government and the, and the subsequent processes where they um, did everything they could to just to move in without seeking free prior and informed consent um, happened much later. So um, in any case, the FTA is the, 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 the broad national agreement. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the, I might uh, throw that to the, to, the, to the panel if they can update us on the current status of that FTAA. Um, an FDAA is renewable for another 25 years. So um, the government can unilaterally renew the FDAA of Oceana Gold. Um, the other problem with Oceana Gold is that, like you said, um, the FDAA was issued before, uh, in 1995, before the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act was passed. So there was no need for consent um, from Indigenous peoples whose indigeneity they don't recognize anyway. Um, <laughs> but the local government code uh, requires also consent from the local, uh, from the municipal and the provincial governments. Um, So, but the but at the time that the FTAA was uh, given was granted, um, there was no or little local government opposition, so there was no problem for the national government. In any case, um, right now the national government can just uh, renew the FTAA. Yeah, if I may add to that, um, it's already in the office of the president, their uh, application mm -hmm. for uh, renewal of their FTAA. Um, again, the Mines and Geoscience Bureau under the Department of Environment and Natural Resources uh, has already recommended since last April 2009, the renewal of the uh, of Oceana Gold's uh, uh, renewal application. Uh, but of course, we are certain that particularly the communities, there will be another uh, agreement which should undergo again the same process, uh, seeking the approval of the community and the local government units uh, which are now opposing and calling for the non-renewal of uh, Shannon Gold uh, 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 agreement. Uh, yeah, that's the status uh, right now. Thanks, Inteng, and also thanks, Lulu, for, for those comments. It's, um, uh, it's probably worth also, I think, um, as speaking about the FTA, talking a little bit about the People's Barricade there and the DPO, and um, because that's really, I think, an inspiring story that um, they've been able to um, to shut down the operation there in the DPO, um, partly due to the expiry of the FTA and with the support of so many people, including. Um, the, the governor of Nueva Vizcaya. So, um, yeah, can we hear a bit more about that? And I wonder if, if Minda's still around and can hear, because it'd be really interesting to hear um, uh, from Minda on, on the People's Barricade there.
uh, it sounds like we're not able to hear from Minda, perhaps. Um, I think it's an internet connection. Probably, uh, Lulu, uh, could you expound more on the people's barricade? And yeah. Wait, yeah. I, I think Minda is. Mm -hmm. Ah. Minda, can, can, you, can you tell us a bit about the People's Barricade? Hello. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, the people here are still, uh, because of the one year and five months um, barricade, the people here are um, uh, almost, uh, you know, devastating. They don't have any more uh, uh, food for their families. That's why they are, uh, uh, they, they, they want to find, um, they, they want to find a job for their family. But uh, uh, no, even, uh, even some of our, uh, uh, com uh, uh, of our uh, friends or our com uh, companion are seeking some of the, uh, seeking job. Uh, some of us is still here to, uh, to stand for uh, barricading. Uh, you know we are sacrificing ourselves because because almost five year uh, uh, one year and five months uh, uh, standing here you know we sacrifice leave our family sacrifice abandon our farm we uh, we are not working actually uh, we we uh, most of us or some of us um, uh, sacrifice ourselves to uh, uh, to 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 stay to our monitoring camp for uh, to 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 monitor the um, uh, the uh, materials or what how do you call that the uh, yung mga materials ng company okay <laughs> you explain uh, certain thing um, we are um, uh, we are uh, 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 tinitingnan namin yung mga ano nila kaya every ta every day you know every day we always there yeah so uh, you know we uh, uh, we are uh, almost um, uh, some of us are uh, are not uh, are tired and uh, uh, we need work we need food you know so we are hoping that um, uh, we uh, we are expecting more uh, help, uh, finances, so that uh, uh, we continue our fight. Uh, is that okay? Thank you. Opo, maraming salamat. Thank you, Minda. Thank you, Professor. Uh, okay, there's a couple, couple more questions here. I, I, actually, there's so much more I, I would love to explore, but... Um, we're coming up to eight twenty-five, and I, I, I think we're supposed to wrap up in around five minutes. Um, uh, so, I'll just look at some of these other questions that have come through on the uh, chat. Um, will the presentations be made available later? Uh, Dominic has asked, um, and uh, I, all I can say this stages that yeah I can try and get um, what presentations I can and, and circulate those um, via the um, IMARC Alliance site. Uh, Natalie can I actually ask you just to confirm that it's something we can do? I think we can. Yeah um, yeah it's something we can we can do it's not going to happen straight away <laughs> yeah. because there'll be a lot of follow-up work after this conference to get all the zoom videos up but we'll make sure in the resources that there's a special section of of this um from beyond mining conference with any of the because some and other sessions other people have asked for presentations so i think we'll definitely make great efforts to do that within the next two to four weeks and we can send that around to all the people who've registered so they can go and access it Excellent. Thanks, Natalie. And it just occurred to me that the Facebook live stream, anyone can go and replay that. Would that be right at any time? So the whole... Yeah, yeah, that will be right. But we'll also have um, all these sessions because the Zoom's been recorded. We'll have all the sessions on the um, Blockade iMark YouTube channel um, because Facebook sometimes, you know, if you don't have the link, it just disappears. So <laughs> we'll keep a more permanent spot within YouTube. And of course, that will all be accessible through the blockadeimark.com website. Uh, 
great. Thank you. Now, I think the final two questions, and I think we've got time to squeeze these in. Um, although I'm not sure if I understand this question uh, from uh, Ron Guy. Um, is there room for case against Oceana Gold, like case brought against um, oops, Nevsun regarding their operations in Eritrea? I might, can, can we unmute um, Ron's mic, please, so he can briefly uh, explain the question? Or, or uh, unless, sorry, I might throw to the panel in, in case they understand it better than me. Um, yeah, there was, there was a case. Uh, there was a case in 2017 where uh, a couple of refugees from Eritrea uh, that were forced to work um, in mines uh, in, in gold mining in, in Eritrea uh, because everybody's forced to forced labour over there for the um, and they took the they, they took the, the company to the they. they made a put a complaint in about the company uh to sue them for uh being treated like slaves uh and working long hours etc etc the company canadian company said uh oh, it shouldn't be heard here it should be heard in eritrea and uh they won that uh, case against uh the canadian company so they actually uh, heard heard their their court case in and of course caused a lot of embarrassment for Nevison and they uh, I believe they won their case there so I was seeing seeing that Oceana Gold is a Canadian uh, company I was just wondering whether there's any any sorts of uh, uh, human rights abuses uh, um, cases that could be somehow heard um, in Canada um, uh, that I guess that's that's the the, the main jux of the matter, jux of the matter, and also I was listening to one of the uh, IMARC uh, uh, is Ria Tinto people talking. Uh, uh, sorry, it was a Canadian government talking, and they've got such a, a to encourage investments in Canadian companies. Um, you put in a thousand dollars, and in different areas, uh, you might end up. Uh, being out of pocket, something like two hundred and seventy-five dollars. So it's uh, uh, to to in, uh, increase the mining uh, the company. So you'd think that that just uh, to me sounds pretty pretty horrific. Uh, that there should be sort of all that uh, tax incentive uh, that happens. So to, so I guess they're two points. But uh, thanks, Ron. Yeah, I might see if um, I, I I've got no idea about that, and I wonder if. Anyone on the panel um, can can respond to to the prospects of taking some in action in Canada, as Ron suggested. And a quick clarification: Ron's drawn the connection there with Canada. Um, I've been referring to Oceana Gold as an Australian mining company because I want to emphasise the Australian link. But it's a, an Australian um, Canadian mining company. It's listed on. Stock exchanges in Australia and Canada. Um, Enting or, or, or Lulu um, or Marfel, did, did you want to uh, respond to Ron's question and suggestion? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Ron. Uh, actually, we uh, have uh, already considered to file a case in Australia and in Canada way back. Uh, in 2017 and um, the, the the thing is is that it's very expensive for us to uh, file a case uh, on the said uh, nation or uh, national uh, courts uh, what we did is that uh, uh, as we studied that option we already uh, Consolidating our uh, evidences and testimonies against uh, uh, Shannon, particularly on the issue of environmental uh, uh, destruction, uh, water pollution, and human rights violation. Uh, but when we assess that it would be very difficult for us, uh, what we did is we filed a uh, complaint in. Uh, the United Nations, uh, 
in December 2019. Uh, and we kind of, uh, uh, how do say, surprised that uh, uh, in the very, uh, in just a few months, uh, nine uh, special uh, rapport tours of different UN uh, special mandate or bodies uh, signed our complaint, communicated our complaint to the uh, Philippine government uh, in February uh, 2019. Sorry, we, we, uh, we filed a complaint in December 2018, then in February 2019, uh, it was communicated by nine uh, uh, UN uh, special uh, rapport tools. So, we, so again, we, we, we came uh, victory for us, and we also believe that help us in pushing uh, uh, not only highlighting our case internationally, but pushing the local government units to, to uh, make a strong stand against the renewal of uh, Oceania Gold. Um, again, we are open to filing uh, 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 legal cases in different courts in Israel and Canada, but uh, uh, we we, we will assess this or relate this to our capacity and uh, businesses. Thank you, Enting. So we're now just a little bit over time. There was one one final question um, from Martin Wong, who's um, um, a member of Multicultural Greens Victoria and also has been doing a great job tonight helping out and has and been a huge help in many sessions for this conference. Um, and um, we, he asks uh, what we can do here in Australia to help. Um, and, and we want to keep this really brief because we're over time. Um, I might suggest that the, the, the best way um, and the quickest, best way to help, quickest way to, to um, answer is to get in touch with, with um, PASA, the Philippines Australia Solidarity Association. Um, and you should find your details those details in the report, um, how to contact PASO. You can find us on the internet um, uh, because we're connected. Uh, um, we're one of the leaders of the campaign here in Melbourne against Oceana Gold, and we can make the connections on all these other fronts. Um, yeah, Joe, I wish we had more time because I would have loved to hear more about those success stories in the Cordillera and particularly Rialco, but we don't. Um, I'll, I might give the the, the uh, panel one chance for very very brief response to if they want to add to what I've said about how um, we can help here in Australia. All silent on for, from the panel. That's fine. We are over time, so um, I'll I'll um, makes it just a few closing remarks and. Thank yous. Um, Martin, can, can you throw up the, do we have a slide there for thank yous? Um, I'll start by um, thanking our, um, our, our speakers, our, our panelists. Um, uh, and, and I should say at this point, um, you would have heard Minda, uh, sorry, you would have heard Marfell, Marifel, uh, Makalanda, um, making quite a few comments tonight and, and I apologise for neglecting Marfell to introduce you properly. So um, uh, so Marfell's been a special guest on the panel, so to speak, um, and um, the leader of um, Pungano, which is the Kogan Valley Indigenous Peoples Alliance. So apologies for the very late introduction. Thank you to all our panel, uh, Enteng Bautista, Lulu Gimenez, Minda uh, Dumang, and uh, um, sorry, Ampi, you're not on the slide because we, we only had the good fortune to, to um, have you join the panel very late in the piece, but uh, uh, Ampi Mangili. So thank you again. It's, it's wonderful to hear um, from uh, such knowledgeable people and, and, co and committed um, land and human rights defenders doing such a great job to serve um, the people in their communities. 
uh, like to thank the the volunteers who've worked really hard on on this uh, to make this event work tonight with all the technology and so on. Um, so um, you can see the names there on on the slide: um, Lucho, Natalie, uh, Joe, Stephanie, um, and oh, we also had a couple of um, late. Um, people join us late so they're not on the slide um pastor bill in guerrero uh and who else sorry for um not having this to hand i can't quite remember everyone who's chipped in there um but look a great great crew um who've done done a great job thanks for all your help there um and yeah and to to all of our guests for coming tonight um and um, the yeah, wonderful um, questions and comments. Um, uh, and yeah, um, as the slide says there, um, I hope you found it interesting uh, um, to, to hear about uh, and um, great to have you more involved if you want to get in touch with PASA. Uh, and finally, um, thank you um, to um, the 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 organisations that have hosted tonight, um, so PASA, uh, Yes to Water, No to Mining, um, and thank you to the IMARC, uh, uh, Blockade IMARC Alliance for giving us the space to discuss some serious issues uh, and for all your um, very hard work organising this conference. So um, with that, I'll, I'll close the forum. Um, Feel free to to um, to hang around if you if you want to chat and if you've got the time, um, and I might also play one last video because we've got just beautiful um, videos that have um, been provided to us. Um, Natalie, are you able to kick off that last one? Uh, yeah, I can. I'm back. I thought I was going to. Oh, gonna oh Martin's doing oh, Martin's it. Martin's yeah. <laughs> Yo 